Is it working? Uh, first of all, thank you, the organizers, you know, for, for the opportunity to speak here. Well, I'm quite uh, more or less marginal in, in long range uh, stuff, but although I did a few, few works, but uh, I'm hoping here to talk about some concepts that might be useful, or maybe some people they might get interested and uh, think about it, especially people that they, uh, they do they do quantum, uh, quantum chains and stuff, but there are some surprising connections to also uh, some uh, more classical uh, oriented people that they work on the Casimir effect. These are works that uh, I've been, uh, uh, this is the concept uh, uh, that I've been uh, working on that in, uh, in last year, since uh, a year and a half. And uh, I decided to, to put a lot of stuff here. It's a quite dangerous thing, you know to talk about all of these things, but somehow, since there are some connections among all these, these concepts, I think it's, it's good to see also the connections, you know. Uh, but my main effort will be just to say that there are some definitions and, that it, uh, and uh, concepts that they, they, they can be really useful. And, uh, well, there will be also a few formulas that uh, to just say that things really work. So I will start with formation probabilities, the definition of formation probabilities in quantum critical change. Then uh, I will discuss about formation probabilities in conformal field theory, how we can really calculate this stuff for critical systems. And then uh, there is an obvious uh, connection between Casimir energy and formation probabilities that uh, uh, when I found out that, that, that there is this, uh, this connection, I was quite surprised why it was uh, missed by, by people that they, they used to work in this kind of things, you know. And then a few numerical results to show that the, the things works. And then at the very end, I might just flash out that uh, another concept, which, uh, which I call it post-measurement entanglement entropy, and then conclusions. Well, the f formation probabilities, uh, I define it like this, you know, take the ground state of a spin chain, and write it in a particular uh, basis. Well, of course, it's the, uh, the, the ground state of the spin chain will be a summation of all the possible configurations. So you have like exponential number of configurations, you know, in that particular basis that you are writing your ground state. And then every configuration will come out with some probability, a very basic things in quantum, quantum mechanics. So you can imagine that you have a spin chain, and then you just say that I'm, I'm going to see that what's the probability of uh, having a string of spins up. Or you, you might be interested in another pattern, you know, in another configuration. But, uh, okay, these guys are going to come with some probabilities, and uh, this probability is what, what I call it formation probabilities. And uh, this, the special case of these formation probabilities has been studied uh, in an in in integrable community for a long time, actually, for almost three decades. There are a lot of people uh, that they, they contributed this, to these uh, studies. But I started to get more interested uh, when uh, I realized that, the, the, that uh, well, actually, the, one of the results of this, uh, the, these guys was that if you calculate the formation probability, for example, for, a, for an easing model, then the formation, this is actually a logarithmic formation process, the logarithm of the formation probability. This guy will behave like linearly with the size of the subsystem. So here, the quantity that I'm interested in is that you have an infinite spin chain, and then you take part of the this, this system, and then you say that when I'm increasing the size of subsystem, how this probability is going to change. And of course, it's in, most of the, in, in most of the cases, it, it should decay exponentially. So, because my Hilbert space is exponential, so this guy will be linear, but there will be another term when you are at the critical point, which looks like, I'm, I'm really sorry, this L and S are actually the same thing. So, there will be also a term which depends logarithmically to the, to the size of the subsystem. When you have a logarithm, you expect always that this uh, coefficient of the logarithm be a universal quantity. So the universality comes from, from this, this point. 
Well, there was a, there was a study by uh, Jean-Marie Stefan uh, a couple of years ago. He studied this quantity in, 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 in the generic spin, spin chain, and he was able to show that actually when you study this guy in a quantum system, in a Euclidean version, you can think about actually having a slit here and try to just find this probability, like that the probability will be actually the, the partition function of this system, two-dimensional classical system, uh, with this slate over the partition function of the total system. Well, this kind of partition functions are st uh, some kind of quantities that we, are, we can actually control in, in the field theory, and especially in conformal field theory. So, it turns out that the coefficients are going to be a central charge. Well, for those that they are not familiar with the central charge, when, when, when we have a central charge somewhere, that, that means that we have now an idea that what's going to be the, the universality class of the, the, the quantum critical system that we have. So we get excited to see the central charge. And uh, well, I think that those that they are familiar with entanglement entropy, they, they might re realize that they, there also we have uh, usually a central charge when we study the quantum critical system. Well, well, why doesn't, well, this one, okay, okay, now it works, yeah. Well, good question. So the point is when you, when you fix, first of all, you say that I wa I'm interested to calculate the formation probability uh, for a particular observable. So you first choose your observable. For example, in this spin chain, you know, you might say I'm interested in sigma z. You know, in the experiment, you know, imaginary experiment, you want to see that uh, the probability is that you want to see that the probability of this guys are going to be up in the sigma z basis. And then you also ask about what, pro, uh, what configuration you are interested in. So these two things, uh, choosing the observable and, uh, and the configuration that you start, they are going to fix a particular boundary condition here. But you need to figure out that uh, which configurations and which observable are going to be conformally invariant, you induce a conformally invariant uh, boundary condition here. This is a, a very difficult question. We have uh, control on particular, uh, on particular systems, but I think uh, it's something that a priori is, is very difficult to, 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 to know about it. You know, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, well, it's exponential number of configurations. You, you need to, to deal with the exponential number of configurations. So you, it's not an easy question. Well, then, in apparently not necessarily related studies, people have been studying Casimir energy and Casimir forces on two-dimensional critical systems, critical si systems uh, for many years, and there are plenty of things are known here. But uh, my interest started uh, by, by the work of these two guys, these two uh, papers. And uh, what they were claiming was that uh, if you really induce some sort of, uh, if, if, you, if you put two objects in the, uh, the, in, the, in the critical medium, these two objects are going to, to, to interact. You know? There will be a Casimir force among them. And uh, in principle, if they, are at the, if they are at the critical point, and uh, if the objects that you are putting here, which means that the boundary conditions that you are forcing here are conformally invariant, you can calculate this stuff using conformal field theory techniques. So, and uh, the, the, part, the, the Casimir energy is going to have two parts. One part is, is the geometrical part, that you can uh, derive using these equations. With these are some technical uh, quantities that I don't want to spend much time on that. But uh, this is uh, but for those that they are interested, this is a Schwarz derivative. It's quite uh, famous in uh, in uh, conformal maps techniques. And then these are F annulus, 
which means that uh, these are the actually the uh, free energy of the conformal field theory and the annulus. So what you do is that you have this medium, you know, this medium, you map it to the annulus. So this guy goes here, and this guy goes up here. So in principle, the partition function of this guy, the whole, is going to be the partition function of this annulus. Plus, another term which comes from the, the conformal mapping. So this is a technical thing. This is something that is already known. But somehow, probably now it's, uh, it's, it's obvious that this guy should be related to formation probabilities. Because as I said, in the formation probabilities, you also have uh, some kind of slit-like things. You know, if, if you think about, for example, the formation probability of two disjoint intervals here and here, what you need to do is actually finding the partition function of this guy, you know, without these two slits. And this is kind of uh, Casimir energy. So this is um, the, 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 the main part of the, the talk. So the, what the quantity that is going to be exactly like a Casimir energy is this quantity, which this P is the uh, formation probability of these two disjoint intervals, this PCA is the formation probability of this guy and this without having this guy, and the, this PCB is the formation probability of this guy without having this guy. And these things can be written in, with respect to the, some partition functions. So this ZAB is actually the partition function of this guy, you know, and then ZA is the partition function of all of these guys without having this slit. And ZB is the partition function of all guys without having this slit. And Z is the partition function of the full system without having any slit. So these are, as I said, technical things. But it's kind of obvious that there is, a, there, is a, there is a relation between formation probabilities in the critical system and the Casimir energy of... Uh, of two floating objects, but here the floating objects are going to be two needles. These are quantities that uh, people have been studying in the, in the Casimir energy. So, for the first exercise, uh, what I did was like, okay, let's calculate the Casimir energy of this, these two guys and try to, to see what's the formation probability, you know. So, to calculate the formation probability, I, I just started to use the, the techniques now in the, the Casimir studies. So somehow the, the, this talk will be more or less like a glorification of the Casimir energy. Well, to just tell, that, tell you that some long-range things also appear, uh, if, you, if you put these two guys a bit uh, far from each other, the Casimir energy will decay like this, which means that your, your uh, and this delta one is the smallest scaling dimension present in the, in the system. It's a, it's a technical thing, but if you like, you can think that this is going to be the scaling exponent in the easing model. It's going to be the scaling exponent of the energy, or there's a scaling exponent of the magnetization. So if you have a critical system with different kind of uh, exponents, you can actually play and find different kind of uh, long-range Casimir forces. And this is also something that already known for a long time in the, in the Casimir energy studies. Well, I hope that uh, these horrible equations, they don't scare you, just I'm emphasizing on, on, the, on the, the, the relations. And the... Well, let, you can try to check these things in, uh, in a simple critical spin chain, which is the XY chain. You pick the sigma Z, you say that, okay, I want to calculate the Casimir energy of uh, this, uh, sorry, the, um, the formation probability of two intervals, these two intervals, and see that these equations are really working or not. Here, I'm showing the result for the easing chain when the gamma is actually one, and then you pick the sigma z, and you look to the configurations all up, or all down, or up, down, up, down, up, down. So they are all are just sitting on top of each other, more or less. And this is the analytical result, that uh, the, the dashed red line. It's pretty surprising, because uh, the equation that I had was pretty, 
complicated. In this case, I have the X exchange. In the X exchange, I'm taking the configuration up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down in the sigma Z basis. And I'm looking at the probability of occurrence of this configuration. And this is the analytical results, and the points are actually the, the numerical results. One good thing is that the benefit that these things can have also for the Casimir studies is that, uh, at least in, the, in this model that I'm studying, you can really study these things for in almost indefinite sizes. If you, if you tell me that I calculated for 1,000 or 2,000 sizes, you can really do these things. But the, this kind of calculations in the really classical systems is almost uh, quite a nightmare numerically. So this, this, is, uh, this is something that actually helps also to see that these uh, this Casimir things are really working numerically or not. Well, uh, another benefit of this is, uh, well, I, I'm going to show another example here. It's, uh, it's an easing model, which uh, you put the, the, the guy inside. One of the benefits of the, uh, this kind of studies is that, as I was telling you, you know, he, this guy is the smallest scaling dimension that appearing in the, in, the, in, the, in the spectrum of this critical system. So when, when you are interested to study the quantum phase and the quantum critical point, you want to know what's the universality class. The first thing that we usually want to know is the central charge. And as I showed you, it appears already here in one interval, so you can really fix Part of the uh, part of the things here to know that what's the, uh, the the universality class of the system. But if you want to know further, to know that what's the spectrum, you know, for example, in the easing model, we know that we have two two critical exponents. We have the energy exponent and the ma the magnetization exponents. So you, the central charge is not enough. You usually need to know the, also the spectrum, and this spectrum also can be seen here because these guys. They have the, the, the information about the spectrum of the system. So by calculating one interval formation probabilities and two disjoint interval formation probabilities, you can actually fix your universality class. So this is something that uh, kind of in parallel to the studies of the entanglement entropy, because a lot of people, they are interested in calculating entanglement entropy because you can actually know about your uh, the, the structure of your universality class. But this is a different quantity. It's, uh, it's not as complicated as uh, to define, at least, as the entanglement entropy, but it gives the same information. Well, it has also, there is also another thing that uh, was motivating me to study this kind of things. And that's uh, Shannon information. There is, a, uh, there is a quantity that you can actually calculate uh, numerically mostly. And uh, it's, uh, well, it's the Shannon information. And in the Shannon information, if you remember, I had this ground state with these probabilities. So you take all these probabilities and put in the Shannon information. And uh, I mean the definition of uh, entropy, you know. And then, surprisingly, we realized that you have a, a volume law, but with a, a, with, with the extra logarithmic behavior, which looks like again the, the coefficient of the logarithm is is dependent on the central charge. So this is another quantity that shows uh, the the the, uh, the central charge. You can calculate the central charge out of it. Well, we have been trying, we check this stuff in, in many models, and where we, we also try to, to persuade some experimentalists to, to see, to calculate these things, and, uh, but we haven't succeeded yet. But uh, anyway, uh, the, the final things that uh, I want to say is that uh, qu another quantity that I've, I've been studying recently, and that's post-measurement entanglement entropy, so this is uh, something that I'm interested in because it's more like a tripartite system. 
You have, imagine that you have a periodic quantum system. It doesn't need to be a periodic quantum system. What you do is that you, you pick a, a, a part of this guy, like A, and then you make a projective measurement here. So when you do a projective measurement here, there is no dynamic. Forget about the dynamic. So you have a ground state. You make a projective measurement in part of the system. And then the rest of the system collapses to another wave function. And when it collapses to another wave function, uh, the, the question that I'm interested in is what's the entanglement of this guy with respect to the rest? Because this guy is already out. So this kind of uh, things are also int uh, interesting when, when you are uh, studying the tripartite systems. You know, it appears also in a concept. Some things uh, it's, it's part of a con another concept which is called localizable entanglement, and that's one of the reasons I'm studying. So this kind of uh, questions are uh, things that also related to to what I was telling before, because you need to have here a configurations with with respect to the to the, uh, to the uh, conformal symmetry of the system to be able to calculate this kind of things. And uh, so I think I'm going to run out of that. OK, the, the, uh, there are some uh, interesting uh, setups here that you can think. For example, you can actually do the, the uh, projective measurement here and also here, and then ask about entanglement in of this guy with the, the other guys. This is interesting because somehow you make the projective measurement and you end up to two completely decoupled guys that they are not especially near each other, but they are quite entangled. So you can really uh, make uh, some cal calculations regarding this, this thing. So what I was trying to say was that uh, using formation probabilities, one can fix the universality class. Formation probabilities are intimately related to the Casimir energy. And uh, Shannon information can also fix the universality class. And uh, this uh, post-measurement entanglement, I didn't show how one can calculate also the post-measurement entanglement entropy in field theories using the Casimir energy, but uh, to just uh, this kind of calculations are so also doable by just using that, uh, that formulas of Casimir energy that I told you before. So, Everything boils down to calculating the Casimir energy. Thank you.